Josh Frydenberg, good morning, welcome. Good morning, Barry. Just we pick up on the underfunding of the NDIS, as Chris Bowen um, says, look, it makes it more, it's important. I mean, the savings here could have been the difference between a credible surplus and a marginal one. Well, look, firstly, the budget is in surplus for the first time in more than a decade. Uh, it's the first payment on Labor's debt. It's the product of a strong economy with more people in work and fewer people on welfare. But Labor's claims about the NDIS are an ugly lie and reminiscent of Medicare. The reality is the Commonwealth will meet every single cent of its obligations to the NDIS, but it is a program where the government pays based on the number of people who are in the program. And today it's 250,000. It lifts to 460,000 over time. And it's no different in the budget papers than how Labor treated carers, veterans, hospitals and schools. But to say that it's a Labor lie, you only have to listen to radio to get anecdotally a different story. I mean, a lot of people are saying they're being jerked around, that they, they blame the system. They say it's a maze and they can't find their way through it. Well, it's one of the biggest policy reforms this country has ever seen. And 250,000 people are now in the NDIS, 78,000 of whom have never received disability support before. Now, there are 10,000 people, both within the NDIA and in terms of community workers who are helping uh, coordinate this program. That's an enormous number of people we have on the ground trying to get this to work and we are absolutely committed in a bipartisan way to the NDIS. But do you accept that there might be some people out there who have just failed to access this scheme when they should be accessing it? Well, there has been issues in the implementation. There's no doubt about that because it is a scheme in transition. And that's where some of the underfunding comes from. But the reality is with the underfunding, um, it relates to to the number of people who are in the program. So for example, in this budget, we found $1.9 billion extra in order to meet more demand for hospitals. So we have met every single cent of our obligations based on the number of people in the program. We have not underfunded the NDIS. We will meet every cost of it and we have $140 billion allocated in this budget to meet the NDIS payments over time. Are you prepared to at least consider perhaps better resourcing the NDIS so that people aren't finding it so difficult to negotiate? Well, as I said, we have 10,000 people within the NDIA and community coordinators who are working on this particular program. We'll do everything possible to ensure that people get the services that they need. We believe in the NDIS, we have funded the NDIS, and we have treated it in the budget papers no different to how Labor has treated other demand-driven programs for carers, for veterans, for hospitals and schools, where they also had major estimate variations in Wayne Swan's budgets. On, on your tax cuts, um, Peter Costello has said that it's a waste of time promising tax cuts any further than two or three years out. A couple of elections are going to intervene in some cases and, and they'll easily vanish. What, what do you say to that? What's, what's the point of promising tax cuts that are four years away? Well, Peter Costello has actually made very clear that the government's come back in this budget to the core narrative, which is lower taxes, and paying back Labor's yeah, debt, what, something that he knows about. What, what, so in terms of, criticism, but though. in terms of the tax plan that we have laid out, it's got two stages to it. It's got the immediate relief, so a thousand and eight, up to $1,080 into the pockets of people earning up to 126000 So if you're a tradie and you're a teacher, you're earning 60000 each, you'll get $2,160 in your pocket in just 13 weeks' time. And then there's the structural reform, which flattens out and simplifies our system with changes to the, to the tax brackets to ensure that 95% of taxpayers yeah. pay no more than $0.30. Cents that's the, that's the four years from now stage. And, and that's what Peter Costello's... Uh, criticism, it's, it's just a waste of time talking about that because nobody's going to believe it. Well, the fact is, under our plan, 95% of people who currently pay tax will actually pay lower taxes. And as NATSEM independent research modelling has shown, the average worker in Australia will be $1,000 a year better off un under us than they will be under Labor. So Labor's all about smoke, some, smoke and mirrors. They will actually tax people more, yeah. not just so on that, income. That's the immediate stuff, but you're ignoring that part of it that I raised, that what's the value of, of, of talking about tax cuts four years away? Well, we have to put in place structural changes. That's the reality. We have to prepare the system uh, for those major changes to bring 95% of taxpayers to the point where they're paying no more than 30 cents in the dollar. Now, Labor is saying that they'll produce bigger, uh, 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 bigger surpluses, they'll pay down the debt faster, they'll put more money into health and education. Are you starting to appreciate what you can do with $200 billion? Well, every time Bill Shorten opens his wallet, people need to check theirs. Because every single promise of his is funded by higher 
taxes. You see, he's even talking about introducing the deficit levy, and at the other end of his mouth he's talking about surpluses. It doesn't make sense. Paul Keating is right, Barry. Labor has lost the ability to speak aspirationally to Australians and to fashion the policies to do yeah, so. But, but do you accept, though, that their dividend is starting to become obvious now? That, sure, sure, there's this extra $200 billion, but now, you, now they, the, the public will get to see what you can do with that kind of money. Well, the social dividend is very clear from our budget. Record spending on hospitals and schools, nearly three quarters of a billion for mental health, respite for carers, uh, when you investing in a major skills package, and of course the congestion busting infrastructure, which is being rolled out across the country in, in record amounts. This is the social dividend that you get from a strong economy. A strong economy is not in, an end in itself. It's not a trophy, as the Prime Minister says, to put up on the, on the, on the kitchen cabinet. What it is, is a means to an end to deliver and guarantee essential services of hospitals, schools, drugs on the PBS, aged care and disability support. And at the same time, Labor is now promising uh, cancer sufferers um, that for most of them, they won't be out of pocket at all in dealing with their treatment. Um, that one seemed to come out of left field. Did it surprise you? Are you impressed by it? Well, no. Well, we've got a series of measures in this budget to actually improve um, the conditions for cancer sufferers. No government has done more than we have uh, for uh, cancer well, it drugs. It looks as if the next government, if Labor were to be elected, will do more by, by making it virtually uh, free, and the treatment free. Are you impressed by that initiative? Well, what I'm focused on is getting better outcomes for cancer sufferers. And let me explain to you what's in this budget. There's a new and the first Cancer Children's Hospital in Sydney. There's money for Peter McCallum here in Melbourne. There's new drugs that are listed on the PBS for kidney, skin, bladder, lung uh, and blood cancer. There's more money for, for bowel cancer nurses, for breast cancer nurses and there are free MRI scans for breast cancer patients. This is all in our budget, plus $400 million for genomics research, including for a 5,000 cancer patient trial. We are doing more than any government to deliver the best possible health care to cancer sufferers. Now that Labor's put this out there, though, would you ever think about matching it? Well, we're focused on delivering our plan that's been outlined in the budget, Barry, and I think it's a very strong plan. On Christmas Island, you spent $187 million reopening it. Was that now based on a, an alarmist view of what the impact of the Medivac legislation would be? No. Uh, what it's been based on is expert advice, and Christmas Island being reopened is uh, ensuring that people don't game the system. That's the evidence well, that, that we've seen. Well, that expert advice, to. though, it, it can't have been that accurate. I mean, given that one person in six weeks has been transferred as a result of the Medivac legislation, and you've, you've got everything ready to go on Christmas Island, and you, you're not using it. Well, you could see it the other way around, which is the so-called emergency that everyone else was talking about hadn't actually eventuated because what we have done by reopening Christmas Island is send a deterrent to people who would try to game the system. Uh, what we have done, whether it's in our turnbacks, whether it's in offshore, protect, uh, offshore processing or whether it's with Christmas Island, we are absolutely focused on ensuring the, there is no repeat of Labor's disastrous border protection policies, which saw a $17 billion uh, border budget blowout, which saw new detentions being opened, centres being opened across the country and tragically people losing their lives at sea. So if it has sent that, that signal, then are you convinced that you won't need Christmas Island between now and when you plan to close it in July? Well, our policy is to close it in July. That's our a publicly stated position and will do so when given the first opportunity. On the Adani mine, uh, the Environment Department, as I understand it, has, has granted the approval. It um, just needs the Minister to, to sign off on it. What, what's the delay? What, what's holding that up? Well, Barry, you're right that the major approvals have already been given some years ago with 180 rigorous environmental conditions attached by state and federal. Now it's going through the process of sub-approvals uh, and the Minister is following the normal statutory process. But from our perspective, we support resources projects and we support them going through the EPBC process. On the other side of politics, you've got Tony Burke saying, I'm not going to prejudge a decision. You've got Mark Butler saying that it's not in the national interest for a day to go ahead and it, you've got Chris Bowen saying sovereign risk would be raised if it was cancelled. So Labor's all a mess. What we will not do 
is what Bill Shorten is saying, which is one message to the baristas of Batman and another to the miners of Mackay. But, but you want to get this signed off before the election, don't you? Well, look, it's going through the normal statutory but process. Can it be signed the... off before the election? Well, again, that's in the hands of the minister who's talking to the scientists because the scientists are the one who need to make... But, but don't you need to get a move on because if Labor will be re-elected, it might never go ahead. Well, like I said, the Labor Party doesn't know if it's Arthur or Martha on this. You've got Bill Shorten saying one message in Queensland, another in Victoria. You've got Chris Bowen, but Mark but Butler, now suddenly and Tony Burke. Shoes on the other foot. Now your your party is being accused of that of trying to adopt a position that pleases both the Queenslanders well, and the Victorians. Barry, we're going through the statutory process by the minister responsible. All right. Well, the uh, the budget's done. When's the election going to be called? <laughs> well, there's no haste. Uh, there's no delay. Uh, we are confident in our budget plan and we are explaining that and unpacking that to the people of Australia. But Bill Shorten's already measuring up the curtains in the lodge and my message is to him, don't go and buy those curtains because just like you, he ran <coughs> a victory lap after the last election until someone tapped him on the shoulder and said, Bill, you've actually lost this election, you haven't won it. And um, This time round, we are going to take to the people our economic plan in a bid to win their trust to keep going. And is May 18 the last date? You're not toying with May 25? Well, there's always been three dates that have been toyed about at, uh, in the media, the 11th, the 18th and the 25th, and obviously that's a decision for the Prime Minister. They're all open. And how much money will we be spending on government advertising this week? Oh, well, we'll continue to spend on government advertising, just like the Labor Party spent half a billion dollars on government advertising. But I'll tell you what, what we won't but be Do you doing. know what the figure is? But I mean, you're the Treasurer. What, what's, what are you likely to spend this week? Well, money is being spent in accordance with approved processes, but and that's all transparent. But what we won't be doing is spending $100,000 like Labor did on three fake kitchens, which could have been better sent to people in need. It's not tra so transparent that you can give me the figure now. Well, it, all, those, all that information will be available. All right. Thanks for your time this morning. Good to be with you, Barry.